got a little song we say to welcome our guests. Come on, y'all sing it. Clap your hands. meaningful and life-changing to help you move through the challenges of life? Then join Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church of Gastonia for an inspirational message prepared just for you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right. Acts chapter number 2. And uh, let's go down to verse number one. We'll begin at verse number one. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless you and honor you and thank you for another opportunity to share in your word. Father, we need your word. It's a word from you that will heal us, a word from you that will set us free, a word from you that saves us. And so, Father, let your word go forth and let it minister even now under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Move me out of the way and usher in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name I ask that you would touch hearts. Let us be receptive to receive your pouring out this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said amen, amen. Look at your neighbor, grab your neighbor by the hand and say neighbor. Oh, good neighbor, I don't know about you. I'm going to help Bishop talk about Pentecost every day. Look on the other side and get another hand. Grab them and say, neighbor, if I hadn't said it, good morning to you. Say, neighbor, oh, good neighbor, good, good neighbor. I'm going to help Bishop talk about Pentecost every day. Amen, amen. Drop those hands now. Glory to God. We need Pentecost every day. This is a message that we started back uh, on the day of Pentecost, that we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. And, and overall, many people dismiss the very need for being filled and led by the Holy Ghost. Too many people who are believers feel that once I am born again, I'm saved and, and sanctified, that I can live my life without the presence of the Holy Spirit. They, they, they feel it is only relevant as it pertains to what we do in church. That's the only reason some people see value in the Holy Spirit, that we need him when we are in worship and singing and so forth. But we understand that we need the presence of the Holy Spirit every day. Somebody say every day. You see, we are attempting to live life as believers and as Christians but without the influence and the direction of the Holy Spirit. He should lead in every aspect of our living. Would you agree this morning? 
we talked about several weeks ago and there's been a few gaps in there that I've not had a chance to get back to this but I didn't want to leave it I gave you some P's as it pertains to Pentecost every day I gave you the one P was promise and another P was power and and another was presence these were the things that uh, that you will experience when there is the presence of the Holy Ghost Another P that I want to drop on you today is productivity. Somebody say productivity. Hugh Welchel, who is the executive director of the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics, did an overview of a book entitled, What's Best Next? Uh, how the gospel transforms the way you get things done. He suggests that the author, Matt Perman, puts his finger on the problem uh, that has dogged us throughout our lives. He says, and I quote, that most of us are feeling that uh, we have way too much to do and too little time to do it. Is that right? I mean, when you think about it, we've got ministry, we've got a home, we've got work, uh, and we've got tasks and things that seem to be left undone. And, and he goes on to say that many of us believe that what holds us back is a failure to become both more productive and better at managing our time and resources, end quote. And then I suggest that some of us want God to add more hours to the day. Is that right? Because you feel like um, that you, you can't get everything that you need to do done. And, and we, as the, as the author Perman suggests, we must reshape the way we think about productivity. He, he talks about uh, gospel-driven productivity. He says, and I quote again, uh, use all that we have in all areas of life for the good of others to the glory of God with creativity and competence. And then, and then uh, he says productivity is not just about getting more things done, it's about getting the right things done. Somebody said we got to get the right things done. See, sometimes we become so frustrated because we're trying to get more and more done, uh, but we've got to do now is uh, reshape our thinking about productivity and recognize that we've got to make sure that we get the right stuff done. Isn't that right? And who best can direct us other than the Holy Spirit? One writer uh, said that, um, uh, Christian productivity is using our lives in the world uh, to, uh, to make sure most powerfully impact eternity. And it is about doing things, things that bring glory to God. But it is also about doing the right things at the right time, in the right way, with the right heart. Can I get a witness? Turn over to Ephesians chapter number 2, and we will discover something that Paul says here in Ephesians chapter number 2, and go down to verse number 8. And Paul says this, he says, um, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Somebody say good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. you got to understand now uh, that what, for whatever reason you think that you are here, you got to please understand that you are here for good works. Somebody say good works. And God expects for us to be fruitful 
and to be productive. For uh, in Genesis, the first chapter uh, and the 28th verse, he said after he created man and woman, he says that, listen, I am giving them the authority to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, and to subdue the earth, and to have dominion. And so from the very onset, God expects there to be productivity from his children. Is that right? And the more we allow the Holy Spirit to be productive in us as he desires, the more productive we will be in our everyday life. You see, the Holy Spirit uh, has a goal, and that is to please the Father. And uh, he is making sure that he continues what Christ was doing uh, when Christ was here with a limited number of followers. And now the Holy Spirit comes uh, to, to, to work with a greater multitude of followers. He wants to help assure that the people of God are productive. And he can make us productive by revealing the areas where we must surrender to his direction. You got to understand that uh, uh, the, it's relevant now in every area of our life. It's relevant uh, to our home life, to our careers, and, and to our marriages and our ministries. That, and the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us uh, into all truth and to convict the world of sin and, and to convince us of Christ and to comfort us in times of need. We need the Holy Spirit in every phase and facet of our experience. And the more we allow the Holy Spirit's direction, the closer we will be on point for doing what he wants us to do. How many really want to do what God wants you to do? Come on, I mean, we're spending a lot of time and energy doing a whole lot of things that don't necessarily line up and mean that we're doing what God wants us to do. Because we can get really busy uh, with doing a lot and it not be what God is doing. And some people become frustrated uh, because it looks like they are not accomplishing very much. And uh, they begin to push harder and to do more and, and to get something done. But it is not uh, what the Holy Spirit is doing in this hour. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian, said, Every Christian uh, must be fully Christian by bringing God into his whole life, not merely into some spiritual realm. Did you hear that? He said into your whole life. That means that uh, your life wherever you are, not just on Sunday, not just as it relates to doing what we do right here uh, in worship, but he says your whole life. And many people miss that. They, and they want to separate and, and have secular and spiritual. But we are all spirit beings, am I right? So everything that we do and everything that we are pertains to being directed by God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We need God's influence and God's direction concerning our marriage. Is that right? Marriages would, would be more fruitful if we would just let God's Spirit direct us and inspire us. Come on, somebody. Uh, but we like to mix a little bit of the world's way in with what God says. And uh, we want to listen to all of the folk on TV. And, and we are watching the dramas to see how they are handling uh, their marriages and their problems. But, uh, but uh, we got a word from God for every situation concerning our marriages. Come on, somebody. Concerning your career, your degree, and raising your children, and how to handle finances, and, and your health and everything concerning our being. Do I have a witness? When we look over, I want you to uh, look at Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8 and, and uh, if, we, if we think about now, the church of Jesus Christ has been birthed. 
It was birthed on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and empowered the believers. They received the Holy Spirit. Uh, the church was established and, and supernatural things uh, began to happen and, and signs and wonders started to happen and the church started to explode. Uh, after Peter's first sermon, 3,000 people gave their life to Christ and, and the kingdom was advancing. And, and, and you got to recognize that when the kingdom of God uh, is advancing and uh, we will have to add now that the devil begins to rage. Isn't that right? Just as soon as there are progressive things done for God, uh, the enemy is always trying to distract uh, and pull from what God is doing. We find then uh, that the first church uh, was established and there was unity in the community in chapter number two of Acts. And you discovered that they were all together and they uh, had all things in common and they fellowshiped together. They broke bread together. They prayed together. They studied the word of God together. There was unity in the community. And then in Acts chapter number three, we discovered that uh, there were miracles and continued church, church growth. And, and we saw even the man uh, who had been lame uh, by the gate called Beautiful, how uh, he was raised up and, and healed and made to be able to walk. And the Bible says he went into the temple leaping and dancing and praising God. Um, but just as soon as that happened, in Acts chapter number four, uh, religion tried to shut down the church. Religion tried to shut down the move of God. Yeah, those Pharisees and Sadducees, the ones who had had Jesus crucified, uh, saw that they were the apostles were still teaching and preaching about Jesus, and they recognized that a man had been healed uh, who had been lame from his birth, and so they, uh, they could not deny the miracle. And so rather than trying to deny the miracle, they threatened the apostles and told them to no longer preach in the name of Jesus. Do you not know that the world today does not want us preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus? You can teach about uh, any other uh, pseudo God or religion, but just as soon as you begin to raise up the name of Jesus, and uh, they want to shut you down. Come on and help me. And they want to shut Jesus down. They threatened them and said, don't preach in this name anymore. And uh, the apostle said, listen, you decide whether it's right or wrong, but we are going to do uh, and say what we have heard and seen, and you can threaten us, but we're going to still teach and preach in the name of Jesus. I wish I had some people who would still declare that they can take it out of the public square, but I'm going to keep on lifting up the very name of Jesus. Laugh at me, scandalize me, call me crazy and fanatical. If you want to, I believe in the word of God, and I'm going to speak it no matter. I wish I had two or three. In Acts chapter number five, the people uh, had a heart to share and uh, uh, they, they were meeting needs by bringing what they had together and blessing other people. And then in Acts chapter number 6, uh, a dispute arose uh, between the Grecian and the Jewish uh, widows. And, and so the apostles set aside uh, the first deacons and, and the deacons began to minister to the people while the apostles continued to pray and to prepare to preach the word of God. In Acts chapter number 7, we discover that one of those uh, uh, first deacons uh, became the first martyr. Uh, his name was Stephen, and, and the Bible says he was stoned to death. He was preaching and teaching and witnessing about Christ, and those religious communities 
did not want to hear it so much that they plugged up their ears and they took uh, Stephen on the outskirts of town and they began to stone him to death. And the Bible said that even while they were doing it, that he looked up to heaven and he says, don't even allow this to be counted against them. Isn't that something? Even though they were destroying him, he still found the grace in his heart to still say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So we come to Acts chapter number 8 and verse number 1 says, Now Saul was consenting to his death, speaking of Stephen. At that time, it says, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Then look at verse number four. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. All right? Now... Notice here, something phenomenal happened. They were still determined to be productive. Even though they were scattered, it's a decision. When you determine that I make a decision that I'm going to be effective and I'm going to be productive because I'm going to decide that what God wants me to do, I'm going to do it. And that's what they decided. Even though they were in persecution and they had to run for their lives, even though they had to be scattered, they still said that we are going to be productive. The situation was not good. Uh, they, they, their lives were at stake. Uh, their, their lives were at risk of being lost. And yet they still, the Bible says, they still, uh, even when they were scattered, they still went everywhere preaching can I give you some principles of productivity and let me tell you something we can't talk about productivity without uh, it being in relation to a goal all right you you are only productive towards something that you are achieving there uh, you what are you going to have productivity in if there's not a goal and so when we recognize that our first goal is to be about our father's business and to win people for Jesus Christ, how many of you have been winning anybody for Jesus? When was the last time somebody came to church with you? When was the last time somebody, uh, you preached to somebody, you witnessed to somebody, and you brought somebody into the kingdom of God? That's our first goal. That's what Jesus said when he was leaving. He said, listen, I want to make sure that you go into the world and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded, and lo, I'll be with you always and even to the end of the earth you might be doing a whole lot of things but if you're not winning people to jesus you are not reaching the goal and being productive let me give you a couple of things number one do what god says is for now do what god says is for now you got to recognize you got to be flexible somebody say flexible the Holy Spirit may have you operating in a way one year and shift it to a new method. You remember when the people of God were getting ready to go into the promised land back in the Old Testament and they had been in the wilderness and they had received manna from God and quail from God uh, every day. But then whenever the Lord brought them into the land of promise, God told them, now you're going to be able to eat from the fruit and the good of the land. Now, if they had not been flexible and willing to do what God says now, they would have still been looking up in the morning, waiting on manna. Do I have anybody? The problem is often we are not flexible enough to allow the Holy Spirit to show us what to do today. Uh, th these saints who had been in Jerusalem were now under a difficult climate and culture. Uh, they needed the Holy Ghost to show them what to do now. 
See, you're going to encounter all types of situations in your career, in your family, in your ministry, in your everyday walk, and you're going to have uh, different uh, situations. What am I going to do now? I need direction from the Holy Spirit now for the season that I'm in today. I know what I did yesterday and the year before, but what would God direct me to do now? Somebody say, do what God says do for now. Another principle do what God says despite the condition or the circumstance. Do what God says despite the condition or the circumstance. Persecution pushed them. All of our days are not going to be sunny and happy-go-lucky. Am I right? Sometimes, and maybe this is for me, all hell breaks loose in your life. Do I have anybody in here? Has it ever happened to you? Somebody might be saying, my God, hell has broken loose in my situation right now. If you only knew my story, you see me here smiling, but if you only knew what I was going through, you got to recognize that things don't always line up. Frustrations and disappointments will try to become the order of the day. But learn to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, uh, to, to make sure that he instructs you and tells you what to do uh, for what God says. Uh, you see, uh, these saints could have allowed what they were going through to determine if they were going to do what the Lord said do. They had any reason to say, look, we are going through persecution we're going through uh, uh, where they're trying to take our lives. They could have said, this is going on in Jerusalem. We're scattering to these other areas. And in order to preserve ourselves, we are not going to speak in the name of Jesus. They could have done that, right? They could have done it. But notice what they did. The Bible says that these went everywhere preaching the word. Verse number four said that they even did what God said do despite the condition and the circumstance. Some of us refuse to do what God says because we're waiting on everything to line up. We're waiting on everything to be perfect. We're waiting on there to be no trouble in our lives. But if you're waiting on that day before you do what God says, you will never start moving because you're going to have trouble. Jesus said in this word, you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome them. Too many base their obedience on circumstances. These people still glorified God. Can you glorify God with a pink slip? Can you glorify God when you don't have enough money to pay all of your debts? Can you still speak and do what your assignment says even when people have walked out on you? Even whenever it seemed like hell's hounds are on your trail, can you still say, I'm going to lift up the bloodstained banner of the Lord? I'm going to still walk in my calling and purpose. Even when they go against me, I'm going to still. Number three, number three, do what God says with a winning attitude, with a winner's attitude. When we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, we have the right attitude. We can be productive. Am, isn't that right? Help us to be delivered from negative. We can't. It's too challenging people. Huh? Don't you get tired of being around? We can't. It's too hard. It's too challenging. It doesn't look like things are going to work out for us. My God, come on, somebody. Uh, we got to have a winner's attitude. Yeah, yeah. If things were just a little different, uh, then maybe uh, I feel like we could get some things done. No, 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 no. You got to know uh, that you got to confess and you got to speak over your life. You got to begin to demand some things according to what your faith is. You got to call those things that be not as though they were. You got to say, I'm going to trust in God. And even when I can't see my way, even when it doesn't look like it makes any sense, I don't have two uh, nickels to rub together but I'm going to still put my trust in God and I got a winner's attitude that I can still be productive I can still, I wish I had two or three 
See, sometimes we are waiting on our situation to change, and the Holy Spirit is trying to change your attitude. I can do all things. And then the last, the last one, do what God says with fruitful expectation. Huh? Notice what it says there in verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, Samaria and preached Christ to them. And this is Acts 8 and 6 now. Acts 8 and 6 says, And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Verse 7, For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Notice now, uh, Philip went preaching with expectation. He didn't go uh, preaching that I'm, I'm doing this and I know it's in vain, nothing's going to happen. I'm in a place where I'm with a whole lot of folk that don't understand and I'm in a place where uh, people have never really had real relationship with Christ. They don't know anything about it. No, he went preaching and believing that if I lift up the name of Jesus, Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. And the Bible said that he became productive and there was fruit that uh, will remain and you got to recognize that just just when you believe that you can be fruitful and productive God will give you increase. Is there anybody this morning who believes that despite my situation that I can be productive in my life if I just put my trust in God? And so I just wanted to say this morning uh, in the midst of the kind of things that we're living in where new cycles change by the hour, where uh, troubling circumstances keep emerging, and we're in times where uh, many are deciding to give up the fight. And many are deciding to throw in the towel. And many have decided to lose their hope and feel that all their best days are in the past. But I don't know about you. I'm declaring that uh, uh, for the rest of my life is going to be the best of my life. Is there anybody in here? No, my better days are not behind me. My better days are in front of me. And this is the time to declare. Uh, yes, that the, the whole direction and the inspiration and the leading of the Holy Spirit is what's going to cause me to be productive. And I don't know about you, but I'm decreeing that I shall be more productive than ever before. Um, for God wants us to be productive. For he instructed Adam and Eve to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish and to subdue and, and you can tell when there is godly productivity because when there's godly productivity things will begin to change i gotta tell you what it says in verse number eight of acts chapter number eight it says uh, after all those people were cleansed and and after those people were healed and after they received jesus christ it says, and there was great joy in that city. I wish I could get somebody who would understand. My God, it may be that that's why there is heaviness and gloom and no Christian godly productivity because there ought to be some joy. When there's joy, you'll see it's because of productivity. Maybe that's why our homes are still gloomy because there's no Christian uh, productivity. Maybe that's why we're walking around defeated, frustrated, and aggravated because there's no uh, godly productivity but whenever there's godly productivity uh, the Bible said there'll be great joy 
They brought great joy to a gloomy city. And I just thought to tell us that, that we can transform this world. We can use our influence to the glory of God if we would just lift up his name and don't wait on ideal circumstances. Don't wait on the right opportunity. But wherever you are and whomever you're with, you better say, for God I'll live and for God I'll die. And I'm going to put my trust in him. And I declare there'll be great joy. If you want joy in your marriage, start being productive for God. If you want joy with your children, start letting there be godly productivity. If you want joy on the job, let there be godly productivity. If we want joy in the church, there must be godly productivity. And great joy came to the city. We're living in a day where we need joy unspeakable joy and full of glory if we get some joy Nehemiah said the joy of the Lord is my strength you'll have power that'll make you keep on running you'll have power that'll make you keep on climbing you'll have power to be determined that nothing Nobody can stop me. I'm going to be led by the Holy Ghost. I got joy. Say joy. Because I'm producing for the Lord. I don't know about you. My heart is fixed. My mind is made up. I'm going to serve the Lord. No matter what they're doing in the culture. No matter how many things are wrong. I'm going to serve the Lord. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Hallelujah. If you're looking for dynamic worship, inspirational teaching, and a friendly atmosphere, you can visit us on Sundays at 221 West Bradley Street in Gastonia, North Carolina. For more information about our ministry, you can call 704-865-9016. To order your personal copy of today's message or any other broadcast, please call 704-865-9016 and indicate the broadcast date. Or you can just visit us online at www.friendshipgastonia.com. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast with Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church. Make sure you join us next week at the same time. And remember, let God take control and let the Spirit flow.